just a few words of, uh, uh, about my work uh, re that is relating to kind of public square, so you know from where, where I'm coming. I've been involved in uh, the IFES work for many, many years. So I've, uh, I've done a lot of student evangelism, and that has been one of the public settings that I've been involved in the university with public presentations of the Christian faith and, uh, and a huge number of public debates uh, on the university. So that's one setting, but it's kind of limited settings with, with students and in the academic world and uh, certain kinds of issues that is naturally uh, discussed and uh, debated in that setting. Then uh, I was for many years the uh, general secretary of the Swedish Evangelical Alliance, which brought me into many other settings uh, maybe more of what you think about, uh, what you relate to as, as the public square in terms of the more general public debate in, uh, in Sweden and to more of, uh, of political issues. Um, many more visits to the parliament than to the university uh, and um, uh, more interaction with the, the general media of, of news, uh, newspaper and radio and, and, and television. And for a number of years now, I'm leading the Center for Christian Apologetics, Apologia, uh, where I'm uh, more, more focusing on philosophical and theological questions. So again, slightly, slightly uh, different, uh, but, but also re relating to the, to the public square. So just this morning, there is an article in Swedish newspaper that I have, that I have written that is a critique of a radio program on the Swedish BBC, if, if I can say like that, uh, the national, uh, national radio. They have just introduced a new series of program. It was the first, first program uh, about reading text from the Bible, just from the perspective of the Bible is such an influential book. Um, so many have heard a number of the stories, Let's just discuss text from the Bible. Very good idea. <laughs> I really like the idea. But it was executed in the most horrible, horrible way. They were discussing 1 Corinthians 15 and the resurrection. And they just immediately said, we know that dead people cannot come back to life. They cannot rise from the dead. And no one mentioned the fact that Paul is claiming that God raised Jesus, and it was not a phenomenon within nature. Of course, nature cannot throw a dead person back to life, but if there is a creator to nature, of course he can raise a dead person. Of course he can raise Jesus from the dead. So, um, yeah, that was an, uh, the most recent example. Uh, so that's for, that's for today, actually. Okay, let me, let me share some of what has been my thinking during those years uh, in, in, in the different uh, settings uh, when it comes to being engaged in the public square. The, uh, the structure of this, uh, this session will be, I will give a presentation, an overview of, of my thinking, and, uh, and then you will be able to, you will have the chance to discuss and react in, in small groups, and then we come back to uh, a Q&A. One of the immediate challenges we have in our culture when you come into the culture as a Christian voice is that we have more and more become a culture with kind of stomach reactions. Do we like it or do we dislike what we, what we hear? So we have this Facebook mentality of immediately responding, often very strongly, often very emotionally, to uh, affirm uh, or to reject. And that makes it very difficult to be a voice. And we can see that so much of the, the discussion is running after the likes. <laughs> that is so important, much more than understanding the content and, and reflecting and discussing the specific ideas. And this is a, a, a general trend in our society where there is a big change from focus being quite uh, quite clearly before to discuss true and false 
And that has not totally disappeared, of course, but it's moved, moved on so much to be discussions about good and evil. And in relationship to being a Christian voice, it's in many settings, it's not the discussion, is the Christian faith true or is it false? Do we reject it because we think it is false in its claims? Now a lot of people are viewing it through the lens of, is it good or is it evil? And they reject it because they think it is evil. It's kind of moral category instead of the truth category. Uh, and the moral category is filled with so much emotions uh, and makes it, uh, makes it difficult to, to be the Christian voice if you are viewed as coming from the evil side. <laughs> it's worse than coming from the false side. <laughs> Of, of, uh, of the debate. So that is, um, that is a real challenge we have to wrestle with. How, how can we work well creatively in a situation there where a number of people will have this uh, perspective uh, on us? We live in a, um, uh, in, in a time where there's a lot of incoherences. I think you can say that about most times in <laughs> human history. But you can say it also about our time. And it's incoherent that in, in a number of issues, it's really relativistic. But then at the same time, it's very moralistic. And as I said, we come from the moral perspective of good and evil. And you judge a lot of perspective as evil. And it's really judgmental, even though it's viewed as really bad to be judgmental. <laughs> So that's such a complicated inconsistency in our culture that people move between being relativistic and very moralistic and to hate judgment and being judgmental at the same time. And it makes a lot of discussions very, you can say, complicated. Yeah, you know all this. <laughs> you have felt it, I guess, if you have moved into the, uh, the, uh, the public discourse. Okay, that's sad about our culture. Let me go back to a biblical text that, um, uh, that I think is very informative when we start to think about being a voice in the public square. And that is 1 Peter 2 from verse 12. In Swedish translation, there's a, often a heading um, above this section, and it says, Christian in the world. So that's a good heading for this session, isn't it? to be Christian in the world. At the same time, it is a text that a lot of, of people in Sweden, uh, uh, a number of non-Christians have criticized these kinds of texts, and a number of Christians have been embarrassed about it because it's a text that on the surface looks like a Christian uh, just submits to authority and therefore is not criticizing evil. So it's a text that historically sometimes have been used by those in power to keep the, uh, the people in their place. And, and um, injustices have then just uh, been able to continue. But I think that is a, uh, uh, it's not a true reading of the text. So let me read 1 Peter 2, verse 12 to 17. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good steed and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. So, a few, uh, a few things here. First, this is really a calling for us as Christians to be involved live among the pagans, don't withdraw, live among the non-Christians who are around you. 
so they may see your good deeds. If we isolate ourselves, they don't see what we contribute. And we are called to actually silence this accusation of being the evil people. And in order to do that, we need to be present and show that those accusations are wrong. So we are called to be involved in public life, in the community, and be part uh, of this created order together with uh, non-Christians. Secondly, in that involvement, we are called not to be revolutionaries, to undermine what has been built up, but to be constructive. I think that is the point when Peter is talking about we should submit ourselves to the basic structures and orders of society. Now, he will say more later, but uh, this is the first attitude. We are constructive citizens in our society. We show proper respect to everyone. We are not there to undermine and destroy and, and um, revolutionize everything. We are even called to honor the emperor, even if it's a Roman emperor. <laughs> with all the evil that is connected to that, it's, it's still a kind of structure. But this needs to be read together with a moral perspective. Because the emperor and the governor, they are sent by God to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Now, if the emperor and the governors do the opposite, to commend those who do wrong and punish those who do right, of course we need to protest and work against that. So the fact that we are constructive in our starting point does not mean that we bow down to whatever is said by the authority. Not at all. We can, with a moral perspective, and when the structures in society and the authorities in society do not live up to what is their God-given calling, we must raise our voice and criticize them and challenge them. We should not use our freedom to cover up evil, and we should not let other people come away with covering up the evil. So we need to expose the evil in our society. So I think Peter, in a beautiful way, holds together this of being constructive, not a destructive revolutionary, but at the same time, a very strong moral perspective which implies a lot of changes because our different cultures are morally corrupt and the power structures are morally corrupt. And we need to be part of those who object towards that and try to reform it. And secondly, above all, there is a theological perspective, which means we cannot submit to what is evil. It is God's will that by doing good, so we have God's will as a higher authority than the emperor. And we see ourselves as God's slaves or servants, not the emperor's servant, ultimately. And we live our lives for God's sake, for the Lord's sake. So you see, Peter here is weaving together a number of perspectives. We are called to be involved, not isolate ourselves. We're called to be constructive, not revolutionaries that just destroy things or overthrow things. We have a moral perspective that will mean a lot of criticism towards what's going on in our society. And we have a theological perspective that above all, we want to follow God's will. So that is a kind of theological background, how I view my calling. Uh, as, as a public voice. I also think it's interesting that we see so many examples of biblical activism in a specific culture. If we just had the New Testament, we could, it would still be wrong, but we could get the impression that a, a Christian primarily is someone who leaves their fishing business in order to follow Jesus. Uh, and we all should become traveler missionaries together with Paul and his team. Because in terms of the amount of texts, that is the picture. But if you take the whole Bible, and also you read the New Testament carefully, 
we have so many wonderful and inspiring examples of biblical activism in all different spheres of life and society. And in different ways, where God using different people with their different giftings and, and where he has placed them in history and in their specific context. So we think of Joseph, who through so many tragic circumstances, ends up as the key political leader in Egypt, Egypt saving thousands of people, 10,000 of people maybe, I don't know how huge the population were, or hundreds of thousands of people, but really a key political leader because of his administrative and strategic vision for how to structure a society. Uh, we can think of the midwives that uh, Peter mentions during the, the Bible study, whose names we know, fantastic. <laughs> and they, their civil disobedience, when the authorities demanded evil acts from them, they were disloyal at that point. We can think of Esther, who surprisingly becomes the queen and in, in a, a, comes into a position where can, she can have real influence. We can think of Jeremiah, who in a very provocative way, you should read Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 7 sometimes, where he is criticizing the religious hypocrisy of his day. And he's doing it just outside the temple when people are coming in to worship. And he's really challenging them. A public voice, very painful. Or Ezekiel, even more strange, a, a one year can sit in strike to protest what's going on in his society. Or we think of Daniel. In one sense, very unlucky figure in being deported uh, and in a foreign culture, but he raises up to this really important position under Nebuchadnezzar and has this enormous influence because he's faithful to God in that position. We think of Amos, who's criticizing international affairs, uh, addressing the different nations and the evil they are doing. We can think of, <clears throat> and now we go to the New Testament, some unknown figures. And suddenly there is a law lawyer appearing in the letter of Titus. Uh, Sino, he is a lawyer. I'm quite sure the Christians have a lot of use <laughs> of him <laughs> in their situation. An educated lawyer with a position within the legal system, we suppose, since he is called a lawyer. And he was serving both in society and I guess he could help some Christians sometimes. Apollos, who is described as an academic, he came from Alexandria. He had access, we can guess at least, to the, uh, the library in, in Alexandria. Uh, and he was a highly learned man, so he was more of what we should call an academic. Erastus, who was the treasurer in Corinth, so high financial position in one of the big cities. And Dionysius in Athens, who was a member of the Oropagos, and we have no hint of, uh, 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 of him leaving that position. So he became a Christian, and in my mind he stayed in the Oropagos and made an influence for the... Uh, uh, the development in, in, in Athens. And in Philippians 4, uh, Paul talks about the people at the emperor's court. <coughs> really interesting. Uh, people working for the emperor, they have become Christians, but they have continued to work for the emperor, the Roman emperor, with all the evil things associated with that. But they made a contribution into that system. So, Here's so many examples of biblical activism, of people that God called and gifted them, and placed them in situations, and they could have an influence in society. They were voices in their time in the public square for what is good and right and true. And uh, so we have the same kind of calling. Okay. <clears throat> With that background, uh, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about uh, being an evangelical voice and I try to reflect over uh, my own experience, um, uh, I have not had uh, any 
uh, any grand strategy in my life. I uh, had never imagined uh, when I was a student uh, what kind of platforms I later on would be on. So this has been a lot of, um, I've just been placed in situations and uh, uh, I've learned by trial and, and error. And, uh, but in hindsight, of course, I can reflect over what, what has been going on and of course, I have tried during the, the way to be strategic and think through and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. And here's a, here's a few of my, uh, my reflections of being an evangelical voice in, uh, and in my situation in a very secular, secular setting where the churches have lost much of the influence. Those churches that are mainly heard in the, uh, in the marketplace are from the very liberal position. So the, former Lutheran state church. Of course, the archbishop is often in the, the public square. Uh, but the Lutheran church in Sweden is theologically one of the most corrupt churches in the world. So they are on the extreme spectrum. Uh, and then we, ha we ha uh, have a few evangelical voices like uh, Per and uh, like Olaf, who has been here a number of times, and myself and a number of others who is involved in, uh, in the public square. So, firstly, uh, it's been really crucial for me to understand the role of religious freedom and freedom of speech and to again and again return to the position that I am a person that argues for freedom for all. And in a lot of discussions, our critics uh, want to silence us and they describe us in a way that, um, that shame us. And in that situation, it is really important to constantly, even if this isn't the, the issue itself, you are discussing a specific issue that remind both your opponent and the, those listening that my position is that you have the right to, to your opinion, you have the right to publicly express it, you have the right to argue for your opinion. And I'm just assuming that you are equally generous towards me. I give you and will fight for your right to have your opinion and express it. And I assume you will give the same freedom to me. We need to create a society where everyone has the right to think for themselves, to form their own opinion, and then have real freedom and space to express that opinion. So it's really important that we, uh, we come forth as, as people who fight for freedom, not only for ourselves, but also for our opponents and for, for other groups. Um, and in Sweden, most of our opponents, they belong to the majority and they take for granted that they have the right to speak, of course. <laughs> But they, they, uh, they often ignore our right to formulate our position and to be respected. Of course, uh, we need to learn to be criticized, but we need to be respected in the sense of you have the right to have that position. We, res we respect that you hold that opinion. So uh, freedom for all. Uh, this means that we also in in uh, those issues that relates to religious freedom and uh, freedom of speech, we should uh, go side by side with, with uh, people that we on a number of issues don't agree. So of course, we can as evangelicals work with, um, uh, with Roman uh, Catholics and Orthodox. I've done that on a number of issues. Uh, religious freedom is one of them. Uh, medical ethical issues like abortion and euthanasia and, and uh, also when we had a big debate on uh, same-sex marriage. I, I worked closely with the Roman Catholic bishop in, in Stockholm. And then in other issues, of course, uh, we cannot work together that closely because even though we are Christians, we differ uh, substantially. Um, and we can work together with secular humanists if they agree to the same uh, extent to those freedom issues.
secondly, we, we need to work with ourselves to show gentleness and respect in the debate. And um, <clears throat> uh, a number of decades ago, uh, there were quite often more aggressive Christian voices you can say from a more fundament, uh, fundamentalist perspective, <laughs> causing quite a lot of harm uh, because of the attitude in the public debate. That is not the case in Sweden any longer, uh, I, I would say. Uh, but this is still ver very important that, um, that Christians in the public sphere, sphere becomes known for being respectful and showing gentleness. Of course, there, there can be a play, place for irony and sarcasm and humor and uh, wit and also being sharp, of course. But it needs to be combined with, uh, with warmth towards the other person. It's, uh, uh, it's a horrible situation when, uh, when, pe when you are together with people and you have this contempt for each other. I've been in a TV studio with uh, people from the, um, uh, from the gay lobby in, in Sweden when we were discussing same-sex marriage, and they refused to shake my hand. So I know how it feels to be you know, rejected in, uh, in, in that way. That's an awful situation, just before going into a studio to discuss together. Uh, and we need to, to break all that kinds of attitude and need a show that gentleness, respect, that we affirm the other person as a human being, as a person, as a, a, a someone who's valuable, uh, even though we, we can sharply disagree. Thirdly, we need to work with logic and coherence. Now, that is not always appreciated, and that is not always the gateway in, uh, in, in the discussions in our culture. But still, we need to work on that. And long term, it has, a, it, it has real significance. Uh, you, you know what Rock the Sock Day is? Or am I using, per, am I using the wrong? Rock Sockerna? I thought that was international, that you celebrate, um, uh, you celebrate people with Down syndrome. So, yeah. yeah, so it, it's an international day. It's called Rock the Socks because on that day you're supposed to have socks with different colors on. Yeah. To Odd socks. Odd socks, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, and it's an affirmation of uh, people with, uh, with Down syndrome, a celebration of diversity. And in, in Sweden that has been quite a big thing. It's highlighted on national TV and and uh, it's really important to, to show the respect to, uh, uh, to people with Down syndrome. And they are, uh, they've been part, people with Down syndrome have had uh, significant roles in, in one of the most well-known uh, TV commercials uh, uh, as a way of uh, just highlighting their existence and their contribution. Okay, so that's one, that's one aspect of, of our society that uh, people will applaud if you show affirmation for people with Down syndrome. On the other side, you look at the statistics and nearly every child with Down syndrome is aborted. What is the logic behind this? That it's absolutely okay and nearly all parents abort their child if it has Down syndrome. But then it's extremely important that we don't view people with Down syndrome in a different way than we view others. This is totally logic. Let's point that out. There's something strange going on. Regularly, it comes up in, in the news that uh, uh, girls are aborted more often than boys. In Sweden, that is nearly uh, only dependent upon uh, uh, immigration, people from other cultures. So it's a recent problem that you can see this, the, that, that, that this happens. Then a strong reaction, 
you cannot abort a child because it is a girl. On the other hand, the law says you have the absolute right to abort a child for whatever reason. So suddenly there's one reason where it's wrong, but then it's right for all reasons. It does not fit together. I was involved in a, in, in a debate a, a number of go years ago with a, uh, with a, 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 a well-known uh, feminist and political leader, Gudrun Freeman. <laughs> and we were, the, the discussion was about uh, um, uh, insemination for single women, where the laws in, in Sweden says that the child has not the right to know the father until the child is 18 years old. So the law withdraws the father and the knowledge about the biological origin from the child for the first 18 years of their lives. And uh, this feminist was arguing then for, uh, why make such a big deal about biological uh, parent and the biological origin? Why? Why make such a big deal about that? So then I responded to her and asked, OK, why don't we let women, at the, the, uh, when they're coming in to de deliver the, uh, uh, their child, you take for the whole day, women just deliver their child. And then in the evening, you just randomly hand out the child. What is the point of biological origin? I think that's a good question. How can we downplay that side totally in one case and then everyone intuitively know it's absolutely impossible to do? You cannot even think about it. The horror of a woman delivering a child and then going home with another child. You know, Sometimes we have those cases, and it's huge in the media, the, the catastrophe of that happening. OK, so we need to think through as many of those issues as possible to find the logical tension uh, within our culture. Fourthly, we need to work on many issues. I have mentioned here. Uh, issues related to uh, sexuality and to medical ethics. We need to work on many, many more issues. And uh, I have very consciously worked quite a lot with issues re relating to the, to the historical Jesus, just to, for work on a very different uh, subject. I've done work on science and faith. Uh, uh, we have... Um, we have done uh, work on the issues of trafficking. We have done work on uh, the persecution of Christians, not so much in Sweden, but in other countries, highlighting that. So we need to work on a variety of issues, not only the hot button issues uh, in, in a few ethical, um, uh, ethical issues. We need to be known uh, as people who are concerned about, about human life, human society in all its breadth. And of course, an individual has a limited number of issues that where you can, uh, you can contribute, make real contributions. But together, as evangelicals in a society, we need to make sure that we have voices coming from many different perspectives and addresses questions in a, in, in a meaningful way. And of course, today, we need to use a variety of platforms and mediums and, and formats. Uh, that was not such a big issue uh, a number of years ago. But now we need to be involved in many different, uh, on many different levels uh, and formulating an evangelical, uh, an evangelical voice. Uh, my uh, successor in the Evangelical Alliance, Olaf Etzinger, and, and the team at the Swedish Evangelical Alliance has been very successful in coming into Swedish media. Uh, from the different angels. That's been really, really uh, encouraging to, uh, to see. And late, uh, last, we need to speak from general revelation, that is from creation 
uh, and what everyone can relate to and understand. But as Christians, we do that informed by special revelation. So, of course, I take biblical teaching really serious, but in the public debate, I cannot quote the Bible or argue directly out from the Bible. Of course, I can, but it will have um, uh, limited force. Uh, so I'm not afraid of saying I, I also believe this because I, I follow biblical teaching. But in my argumentation, I need to train myself to find the arguments from general revelation, just from how reality uh, works. Um, I have some, sometimes um, uh, uh, told you my experience when I first came to Labrie in Switzerland in the, uh, in the mid mid 80s or late 80s, my mid 80s, um, and started to, uh, to, to listen to the teaching of the Labri teachers. And there was one thing that stuck out amongst, the, yeah, amongst many, but there, there was one thing that I really noticed. On so many different uh, lectures and presentations, the word reality reoccurred. And I compared to my, the, the Christian circle I came from in Sweden, no one talked about reality. That, that was not a typical Christian world word, but at Labrie, everyone talked about how this relates to reality. That is general revelation. Try to understand this world that we share together with all other human beings, to understand it and then to relate the Christian faith to that. So how it corresponds to reality. And that has been a, a very important thing for me. So I continue to speak about reality. <laughs> okay, so that wa was a number of um, reflections from, uh, of, of being an evangelical voice. <laughs>